So welcome to the Gateway API workshop. I'm Flynn. And this is Mike. I'm Mike. <laughs> I am a tech evangelist with Buoyant. I work primarily with Linkerd. In a past life, I was also the original author of the Emissary Ingress API Gateway. And these days, I work also with Gateway API, and I'm a co-lead for the Gamma Initiative. Over to Mike. <laughs> uh, I'm a product manager at Microsoft now. Uh, I'm currently working on our upstream open source service mesh team uh, with uh, Istio and Gateway API. Uh, I've been involved with the Gateway API project for over two years now, and prior to that, I was uh, at HashiCorp working on console service mesh, so I've been around the service mesh space for quite a bit. And you also used to be a co-lead of Gamma. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I was one yeah. of the founding co-leads of Gamma, along with uh, John Howard from Google and Keith Maddox from Microsoft. So what this means is that you have a couple of people up here who now work in marketing and management trying to talk to you about technical things. <laughs> Wish us luck. Well. <laughs> um, I should also apologize in advance if you see me making weird wincing faces or something. It's because I broke this collarbone a week and a half ago. It's not a commentary on Gateway API. Or because we broke our demo. Well, we might have broken <laughs> the demo anyway. I mean, we'll find out. Um, we also... We haven't really gone through and done a lot of workshops in this format before. So on the one hand, I don't actually know if it's going to take an hour and a half to get through everything. Uh, but you know, feel free to ask questions. And I believe there are a couple of microphones out of the audience if you want to, or just you know, yell out, and we'll try to help people out. Um, and if we finish early, then we finish early, and that'll be great, because that will mean that everything went swimmingly <laughs> <laughs> and it's really easy to use. So who are we here for? Yeah. We're here for platform engineers, application developers, infrastructure people, uh, really anybody who's trying to work with applications in Kubernetes. If you are doing applications in Kubernetes, you will always have to solve problems that Gateway API is here to solve. If you are doing Kubernetes and you're not doing it for the purpose of applications, then I'm not sure what you're doing exactly because nobody runs clusters just to say they're running the cluster. Everybody's trying to do something with a cluster. So that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah. And one of the strengths of Gateway API is really um, that it's also for platform engineers too. So even if you're not running the applications yourself, right. you can empower the application developers on your team that you're building for to be able to do things autonomously like on their own. Very much so. On the agenda today, we will talk about the Ingress problem, which is separate from the Ingress resource and separate from <laughs> Ingress controllers. Uh, yeah, We'll talk about how Gateway API relates to the Ingress problem and to service meshes as well. Uh, then we're going to go in and we're going to do a workshop to let everybody get their hands dirty, and <laughs> hopefully things will work. You will need a Kubernetes cluster. The two of us are running K3D because the two of us really wanted to set things up ahead of time to make sure that it was going to work. You get uh, our local development running with yeah. conference Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, you don't have to use a K3D cluster. You can use your favorite cloud provider. If you don't have a favorite cloud provider and you want to use the Sivo cluster, there's a link up there which you can get yourself set up for. You will need Kube Control. You'll need Helm. It, we are going to demo things with the bat command, which is just kind of a more polite version of less. Uh, if you don't have bat and you don't want to install it, just type less instead. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, and YQ it's, it's, shows up a couple of times. It's huh? nice. I use bat instead of cat. It colorizes the output in addition to a few. Other and it also pages. And it's just it's a nice tool. It works out really nicely. YQ is a similar tool for uh, YAML, so it can yeah. colorize. You can filter it in the same way that like JQ works with JSON. Yep. Um, the workshop is currently set up to download either the Linkerd CLI or the Istio Control CLI, depending on your choice of service mesh as you go through the workshop. Uh, the workshop source, I apologize for not putting a QR code in there. You can clone the buoyant.io slash gateway API, well, or gamma workshop. See, this is we, we, we moved the repo <laughs> yeah. last minute. <laughs> Let's, uh, there we go. Like I said, Gateway API Workshop. <laughs> you can clone that, and you will see both all of the resources that we're using, all of the scripting that we're using. The readme is actually the executable code we'll be going through. Um, 
So that's a good resource to follow along. Or you can frantically try to type things while we're doing it on the screen. It's up to you. Whatever you are doing, though, please make sure you have an empty cluster. I don't think that the workshop will necessarily break your production cluster, but I, I, I don't know. Well, let's not risk it. Let's I, not I, risk it. Let's, let's just not. I, I threw a little cube cuddle cluster info in there at the very beginning just to make just sure to you're make on sure. the right one. Yeah. Uh, if you want to use AK3D cluster for this, there's a script in the repo called createcluster.sh that will try to do the right thing for you. Given that you are on conference Wi-Fi, the right thing might be a little tricky to come by, but you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, and again, if you want to use Sibo, then that's the repeat of the link. OK. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Ingress problem. When you work with Kubernetes, you start off by getting a bunch of workloads running inside a cluster, where that's what your cloud native application is. And you will instantly run into this problem that your users are outside of the cluster, but your workloads are inside the cluster. And one of the things that clusters try really hard to do is to prevent people outside the cluster from messing with things inside the cluster. This is the Ingress problem. You have to have a way to let people use the things inside your cluster, or what's the point? This is the first problem you're going to have to solve with Cloud Native always. So we tend to do this by sticking some sort of a, a thing right there on the edge of the, of the cluster whose purpose in life is to provide you some control over who can get through that boundary. We refer to this thing as an, whoops, as an ingress controller or you will see in some of the stuff we do here, we talk about gateway controllers because gateway API uses gateways as opposed to the old ingress resource. But, but that's its purpose in life, is to provide you control and to be able to route requests and do all of the fancy stuff that you would like to do. And to, terminology can be a bit confusing. Um, we will try to be explicit when we're disambiguating between lowercase ingress as in like the functionality of bringing traffic into your cluster versus the capital I Ingress V1 Kubernetes API. Uh, we'll go over some history of that in the beginning, and then we'll move on and mostly be talking about Gateway API. I was going to say, I think these next couple of slides are the only places we talk about the capital I Ingress yeah. resource. Um, back in the bad old days, <laughs> Kubernetes invented this thing called the Ingress resource with the intention of using it to solve the Ingress problem. And I think we can say at this remove that it didn't work that well. It, it has been widely used. So it, because it's a problem that everybody has, yes. it is everywhere. And, and we've seen the pain points with it. <laughs> Ingress is actually a really nice example of the way widespread use does not necessarily mean something is a well-designed API for that use. Uh, we found that it had trouble with standardization, OK, so I'm, I apologize. I was about to do the slide points out of order. Terribly sorry. Uh, one problem that we found with the old Ingress resource was that you tended to have one or a small number of Ingress resources, irrespective of how many workloads and how many developers you had. So it tended to be a major point of contention where a developer would want to go and add a new workload, and they would have to go edit the Ingress resource. Or they would have to ask their platform team that carefully guards it because they don't trust any of their application teams not to screw it up. <laughs> yeah, if you have this one big centralized resource that controls a critical piece of functionality in your cluster, the ops guys tend to get very paranoid about letting the developers mess with it. And so this tended to make things slow. Um, Ingress also, there were a lot of things it could not do. So for example, there was at least a long time where it couldn't configure TLS termination and such. And you know, that's kind of basic functionality. You need this sort of thing. So what ended up happening was that people just threw annotations at it to deal with their particular ingress controller. And of course, everybody did that in their own special snowflake unique way. Oh, yeah. So we ended up with 
Uh, I think Nick is fond of calling it the Wild West of annotations. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. The, this is actually a big reason why Gateway API does not use annotations for things, because some of the Gateway API maintainers <laughs> were so badly burned by annotations on the Ingress resource. So overall, the Ingress resource both helped to solve the Ingress problem and created another raft of different problems. So oh. go ahead. Go, go back one second. Yeah. So, so another part of it was just there was poor extensibility mechanisms. And that's why people were resorting to these annotations, is there was no structured way to be able to extend it. So that was like definitely another guiding principle in the design of Gateway API is knowing that we can't build one API that will solve everything. So finding better ways to enable that extensibility in a well understood pattern. I think I might go so far as to say that the Ingress resource had no extensibility mechanism. I, th I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. So that led us to Gateway API. <laughs> you're going <laughs> you're gonna to see this diagram everywhere that you talk talking about Gateway API. Um, Why, thank you. <laughs> it is a project works. within Kubernetes SIG network. We have this set of different CRDs in here that are kind of originally intended to be Ingress ver version 2, or at least to take a different cut at solving the Ingress problem in a way that can be more extensible, in a way that can be more structured. Um, it's not on this slide, but another thing that I think is really important about Gateway API is that it explicitly acknowledges that there are multiple roles within one application in Kubernetes where you will have people whose job it is to maintain the infrastructure on which your cluster is running, and then possibly a different set of people whose job it is to keep the cluster healthy, and then a different set of people to be writing the applications. If you're doing this in a four-person startup, all of these roles might be filled by the same person, but if you're doing it in a large company, they are probably different people, different organizations, but they all have to work together. Yeah. And so this is another thing where Gateway API was deliberately trying to tackle that explicitly up front. Yeah, and, and the reason it's not actually Ingress v2 is because doing a v2 of anything in Kubernetes is very, very <laughs> painful. <laughs> so uh, that, that's why it became its own product, uh, own project. It is still an explicitly a uh, sub project within SIG network, but it is moved out of tree. There are no plans uh, to move it in tree in Kubernetes uh, because we're actually really happy with the flexibility and speed that we have moving as an out of tree project. Um, and yeah, it reached uh, GA with a one point release last October. So uh, yeah, it is at a point where the core resources of it are stable. There's absolutely still a lot of experimental work happening at a pretty quick pace. So keep your eyes on this space and watch for uh, continuous improvements to it. And yeah, we'll, we'll get a bit into more of some of the like, design principles on the next slide. Do we have a slide about release channels? I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, the versioning scheme is a little bit complex, uh, but it's really given us the flexibility to be able to offer both a stable API for consumers as well as have some of the freedom to experiment and iterate and yeah. really work collaboratively to design something uh, for the future. And, and yeah, so like th this is the successor to the Ingress v1 API, which is effectively frozen at this point. It's been around a long time, and new work isn't really happening on that. Everyone who's doing ingress things now is pretty much all contributing to Gateway API. I think that's true. Sorry, it's definitely true that no <laughs> real work is happening in the ingress resource. I believe it's true that everybody doing work in this space is involved with Gateway API, which is pretty. At least cool. the vast majority. Like there, yeah. there are dozens of implementations at this point now. Yeah. Since I don't think we have a slide on release channels, and since you will run into this as you look at Gateway API. Um, there's a concept of a stable release channel and an experimental release channel. So as we go through the workshop, we will be using the experimental channel because of one feature that we'll talk about later. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the thing that I think is important there is, at this point, there's, I'm not sure there's really a lot of significant difference between experimental and standard, except for timeouts, right? yeah. or sorry, except for the port on the... Yeah, the, the, yeah. the experimental channel is a superset of the standard channel. So the intent is that when we're adding new APIs, new fields, uh, new enum values, potentially even small things like that, uh, that we can do them in this separate channel and make sure that they're uh, working as intended before we eventually promote them to standard, at which point it is part of the stable API that has those V1 guarantees. Yeah, we really, we'll see if we can uh, go through and yeah. get this written down while we do this. All right. So we yeah. talked a little bit about the role-oriented design. Standard generic API is an interesting way of phrasing this one to me, but the idea here is that if you think about working in Kubernetes right now, you learn how a deployment works, and then you can carry that from job to job or cluster to cluster or role to role because you already have this knowledge that transferability is a very useful thing in this ecosystem. So that's part of the point of Gateway API, is that you should be able to learn how an HTTP route works and then use it with Istio or use it with Linkerd or use it with your favorite other ingress controller or service mesh or whatever and be able to carry that knowledge with you rather than having to relearn every time how your particular thing at this particular job works. Um, there is extensibility built into the Gateway API. We're not going to talk about it a lot in this workshop. Um, We're really trying to focus on the things that things everybody can... is doing together. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but there are, yeah, uh, a few things. If there's HTTP root filters, um, there are ways for implementations to add their own functionality in a way that is predictable and integrates well with the rest of these resources. Integrates well and predictable. Those are, those are important concepts here. Yes. <laughs> We're going to stick in this workshop primarily to the basics of what can you actually get done today without having to go and do crazy stuff. Should you start using Gateway API now? Uh, probably. <laughs> if you're starting fresh, you should definitely look really hard at it. Being able to learn something that you can carry with you as you move around in the ecosystem is very useful. If you are not starting fresh and you have an existing deployment, it might be more useful to just learn how it works uh, rather than immediately looking to port your entire world over to Gateway API. It's still, you know, 2020 is still a fairly young thing in Kubernetes land. There are still things that Gateway API cannot do. We're working on that. But yeah, it's still good to learn about it. You're going to run across it for sure. And yes, by all means, come and help out building it. Building it. Um, I don't remember if the most collaborative API was from looking over individual contributors or organizations or both, but it's really amazing how many different people from how many different places have been working on this. And it shows. It's really nice. I think it's, yeah, I think it's both, if I remember. It was a talk that uh, Rob Scott gave, I think, uh, last... Last uh, Paris? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, last KubeCon. Last October, uh, yeah. the US KubeCon. Yeah, talked about how uh, so many people from so many different projects have come together. And some, a lot of the core APIs in Kubernetes that are in tree are really just a handful of folks that are building them. Mm -hmm. And the way that we've been able you know, to structure this project has been great for being able to have a low barrier to entry uh, for many different implementations or users to help with even little things, our conformance tests, um, adding uh, implementation details uh, for th with their own implementation needs and helping kind of like shape the APIs as we're building them. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, I just saw the uh, traffic management before. You may be familiar with some of these resources. Istio's virtual service, uh, the SMI uh, service mesh interface spec traffic split uh, that Linkerd has used, uh, the Ingress v1 API, and, and a handful of others. There was definitely a this, proliferation. <laughs> this, this slide causes me actual pain. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> um, 
And with, with Gateway API, hopefully you should just be able to focus on uh, the Gateway API resources. The really two of them are a stable channel right now. Uh, the gateway resource that you attach to um, that represents your infrastructure. Uh, and then the HTTP route is how you write your routes. There's also a thing called a gateway class, which is not on here, but will. It's less important. It's less important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some, somebody has to create it, but it, you know, it may not be you. Okay. Things you can do with gateway API right now. Remember, it got to V1. And the question then becomes, so what can you actually do with it? We actually didn't put at the start, oh, you can use this to route traffic. But hey, you can use this to route traffic. You can do things like, oh, if you see something that comes into slash GUI slash, then it goes to this workload. And slash fate slash goes to this other workload. Awesome. You can do more fancy things like that, like traffic splitting with it. You, including things like you know, routing progressive delivery or failover or whatever. You can do dynamic stuff based on the headers of a request, based on the HTTP method. You cannot do filtering ba or routing based on the body, because that would probably be silly. Um, if you are using this, we should also have put on here, oh, you can do routing for both your gateway controller and your service mesh. And if you are doing both of them, then you get things like progressive delivery anywhere in the call graph, instead of right on the edge where only the gateway can see. Um, we have a demo app that we're working with that we will be using to show this off. This is the Faces app. It has a GUI that talks to a workload called Face, that talks to a workload called Smiley, and a workload called Color. Uh, the Smiley workload, when things are going well, returns a grinning Smiley. The, oops, we messed this up. The Color workload now returns the color blue. Uh, the face workload puts the two together and then hands it back to the GUI. So when all is well, you see a grid of grinning faces on blue backgrounds, not green backgrounds. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have two other workloads here. Smiley2 does return hard-eyed smileys. Color2 now returns orange. In the middle, or rather in the middle of this picture, but right at the edge of the cluster, we have a gateway controller, so we can configure this with gateway API. We have a service mesh in the cluster. You get to pick between Linkerd and Istio. Flynn will be deploying Linkerd. I'll be deploying Istio. And we'll be showing that uh, with this mesh deployed, we have a single set of <coughs> uh, custom resources that we'll be deploying after the initial configuration. Uh, and you should be able to walk through this exercise and have one configuration that works in either your Istio service mesh or your Linkerd service mesh. So we were very tempted to have me do Istio and him do Linkerd, <laughs> but we thought that might be a little dangerous. OK. Let's go ahead and get this started then. I'll let you start, and then I'll be ready to show the Istio side of it. So I have created a. <laughs> I have created a cluster already. And when you do this, you can do it with either demo mesh equals Linkerd or with demo mesh equals Istio. I will do it with Linkerd. Mike will do it with Istio. Um, feel free to follow along as we're doing this. One of the fun things with this one is going to be that we don't actually know if this is really going to work because, you know, as always, we make changes up to the last minute. So I guess we'll see. <coughs> first thing we're going to do here is create. Sorry, the first thing I did here was create a namespace for the Faces application. I have now, uh, this was making sure that Linkerd. Linkerd CLI is installed. I'm now going to make sure that my cluster can actually work with Linkerd. Oh, good. It can. And we will go ahead and install Linkerd's CRDs and then Linkerd itself. I'm also going to install Linkerd Viz, which is the visualization tool. 
Fancy. Ooh. <laughs> and while this is well, taking yeah, a minute well, for I was going to say, how about let's switch to the other laptop and Michael get started with Istio. Yeah, yeah. While this is taking a minute for the code control plane to become available, yeah, we can switch over to me. All right. So I've got my cluster up and running. And now I'm going to uh, run with demo mesh equals Istio. And we'll make sure our cluster is correct and then get going. So I'm using the Istio CTL that I downloaded. It's going to be version 1.20.3. Our pre flight check looks good. And we're going to install the minimal profile. And the reason for doing this rather than the default profile is that Istio's default profile uh, installs an older version of uh, the Istio ingress gateway. So that's something that uses uh, like bespoke Istio configuration, uh, and it also like creates that infrastructure automatically. Because we're going to be deploying this ourselves, we don't want that because it'll uh, create conflicts uh, around. Uh, I forget if it's the port or like the host name that it reserves. So uh, to, to avoid that conflict, we're just going to do a minimal install uh, and get going. See, I always thought you did that because K3D can't handle the maximal install, but I guess I was wrong. No, I, K3D was actually <laughs> fine. Yeah, no, it's just to <laughs> avoid having two ingresses getting in the way of each other. Yep. So we can flip back to this laptop this, for a this moment. This will take a minute. <laughs> yeah. So Viz finished installing. I'm going to run Linkerd check to make sure that everything is OK. Um, I actually did not back up at the beginning and emphasize this and should have. I am currently running an edge release of Linkerd. So this is the completely open source version of Linkerd. Uh, and I'm either using the latest version or like one prior to the latest version. So and you know, it's taking a little bit to finish this last check. There we go. We're ready to go on my side if we yeah, go ahead. want to get going and switch back to my oh, laptop. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh no. All right. All right. All right we can continue um, over here then. The last thing that I did was to annotate the faces namespace to tell Linkerd, any pod that appears at this namespace, just go ahead and bring it into the mesh. This is the simple way of dealing with that on the Linkerd side. Um, now, while we are running this bit, we shall install the Gateway API CRDs themselves. That curl looks really funny on such a narrow window. Linkerd does not ship with its own Gateway controller. So I am installing Envoy Gateway with Linkerd. And once I start this going, then I think this is a fine time to switch back to the Istio install while we wait for Envoy Gateway. All right. This should come up on the screen moment. Huh. Well, we can switch. Okay, I guess we'll just switch. Yeah. All right. Well, let's just finish this out for a second. Sure. Um, the last thing happening here is after getting Envoy Gateway going then I will annotate the Envoy Gateway namespace so that when we go through and create the proxies, the Envoy proxy, then Linkerd will automatically bring that into the mesh as well. I can't do that first because a lot of the sidecar-based world has this issue where if you try to run a cron job, the cron job will get stuck waiting on the sidecar to go away. This is a thing that's addressed by KEP 753, but KEP 753 kind of only just landed. It's not in Kubernetes by default until Kubernetes 1.28. And while we were putting this workshop together, we were on 1.27. So I couldn't use that. And this is the way around it. But yeah, uh, good news for anyone using 
a sidecar-based service mesh. Uh, if you have issues with your application or sidecar <laughs> starting out of order, one before the other, uh, there's a better way to do that in newer versions of Kubernetes now. <laughs> Which is nice. Okay. Let's go back to this, his laptop for a moment here. There we go. All right. So now we've got Istio installed, and we're going to continue. We're going to do a very similar thing. We're going to create the namespace. Uh, and similarly, we're going to set it up for uh, service mesh injection by labeling it. And now that it's labeled, uh, we're going to create, we're going to install the gateway API CRDs and then create our ingress gateway. And as we pointed out, we're using the experimental channel of gateway API 1.0 here. Uh, and I guess I should mention one of the reasons that we're uh, installing the gateway API CRDs. Um, Currently, because they're out of tree, they are not going to necessarily be in the version of Kubernetes uh, that you're installed by default. So some, depending on your cloud provider or distribution, may ship with a version of the Gateway API CRDs installed. Some cloud providers may manage those for you, uh, keeping them updated or at a certain version, depending on your install. Um, we're explicitly installing them manually to make sure that we have the latest version. In particular, I'm not sure there are any cloud providers doing 1.0 yet, are there? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. So um, 1.0 is recent enough that the cloud providers are still rolling out some of this stuff. And for the most part, they are going to be using the standard channel anyway. So the experimental channel, like I said, there's one feature in here that we need the experimental channel for. Um, and so we need to do that manually. Yeah. And yeah, so this is what uh, the definition for a gateway API uh, gateway looks like. Um, so we'll, it's pretty small, minimal right here. Um, you'll notice the only difference that we have between what you're going to see on Flynn's laptop in a moment and mine is going to be the gateway class name. So why that needs to be unique is because that is going to tell which gateway controller implementation should look at this resource and pay attention to it and process it and turn it into infrastructure. Um, in this case, uh, with Istio, the Istio gateway controller is going to be the one that we're referencing from uh, the gateway that we create. It's going to use the Istio gateway class. You heard us mention gateway class uh, earlier. Um, and yeah, the, the rest of it is going to be identical. So we're going to set up just a single listener uh, on port 80 with the HTTP protocol. Um, and we're allowing routes to attach to it from any namespace. Uh, there this is, is important. <laughs> uh, I believe the default, uh, if you don't have this allowed routes configuration, is only allowing routes to attach from the same namespace. So this, yeah, and that's pretty different from the way a lot of the earlier ingress controllers work. So as you're switching over to Gateway API, this is a great way to be confused. Not that I have any personal experience with this. Uh, with creating a gateway class, or sorry, creating a gateway, forgetting to do that bit, and then sitting there tearing your hair out with, well, okay, why isn't my route working? Yeah, it's also a really critical part of that like role-oriented design, where right. you can have your gateway administrator uh, create this gateway, and the allowed routes configuration also supports like label selectors for namespaces and things like that, so you can potentially scope it to only a single namespace is allowed to write roots uh, that attach to this gateway. Um, or you can open it up to everything. Or you can have your application teams create gateways and just keep them scoped to only their namespace. Uh, yep. So it's really flexible. Uh, and yeah, th this is one of the really nice things about kind of this design and uh, where we've ended up at with this API. So you want to go ahead and apply that one and then we'll flip will, over and, and then, show the yeah, link we'll, uh, Jump over to it. So yeah, uh, I'm going to wait for a minute for uh, this gateway to get ready, and we'll switch back over to Flint's laptop. Yep. So this is going to look remarkably like the one that he just did for Istio, <laughs> except that since I am using the Envoy gateway as my gateway controller, then, whoops, 
I press too hard on my mouse, then I'm using this controller name. Uh, I'm also calling this the Envoy Gateway class, and in my ingress, or sorry, in my gateway named ingress, just so we can do this in an even more confusing set of names, uh, I'm using the Envoy Gateway class, and then everything else is exactly the same as for Istio. And now I'm going to wait for my, okay, now my, my gateway controller is actually working. All right. So, so I will start the Faces application installing, and then we'll flip back and make sure things are okay with Istio. This Helm install command looks disturbing, but there's an explanation in the comment up there. Um, basically, what we're doing here is normally when you install the Faces application, it's set up to deliberately be terrible uh, because it was originally written to show off a bunch of resilience patterns. So most of what's going on there is saying, hey, we want both color and color two and smiley and smiley two, but only smiley two should be bad right now. Yeah, and this is just a demo application. It's not any part of uh, the actual stuff right. that you should really care about for your workload. It's just a way to kind of demonstrate in uh, you know, a GUI the different kinds of patterns that we're going to be able to demonstrate as far as like uh, traffic right. shifting and uh, switching and yeah. So Want to uh, switch back to the other laptop, please? And we'll see how Istio is coming along. All right, so I've been uh, watching uh, the resources coming up and everything is running now. So I will jump back. Ooh. One of the cool things about this demo is also that for all that Istio gets a bad rap, including from people like me, <laughs> um, it, you know, you can see that it's taking us about the same amount of time to do both of these. Honestly, the limiting factor in both cases has been pulling the images down. <laughs> It's kind of fun to see that, that for all that we throw shade at each other, you know, a lot of this stuff really does work well. All right. Okay. All right. Let's uh, go back to this laptop for a moment, please. Okay, so. Like it says, we should be able to hit reload in the browsers and see good things. Not or then again, yet. maybe not. <laughs> this is actually not because the application is broken. This is because the bit that we did not do. Any guesses? Anybody? We've created a gateway class. We created a gateway. Any suggestions for what we have not yet done? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. We did not yet actually route any traffic here. We also so, did not break our demo, as uh, I was scared about when I initially walked through this. <laughs> I got to confess, I, I tweaked the demo to do this, and I forgot to tell Mike about it. So he was very concerned that, that the world has suddenly come to an end. <laughs> Sorry. So this is our first HTTP route where we're, for our parent ref, whoops. Actually, let me back up. This is an HTTP route. It's in gateway.networking.cates.io slash v1. It is an HTTP route. I'm going to name it faces GUI route in case I need to deal with it later. It's in the faces namespace. This is why we told the gateway, hey, you should allow routes from any namespace. It's very, very convenient in most cases to allow application developers to put their routes in with their application, because that way your RBAC is simpler, people can more easily find the routes, et cetera, et cetera. If you have to deploy your routes in a different namespace than the actual backends that you're routing to, that's also possible with Gateway API. Uh, there's a little bit more permissioning structure to allow that, uh, to make sure that it's safe, that you can't just have anybody directing traffic to anything else in your mesh. Uh, you'll want to look for the Gateway API reference grant resource uh, if you need to be uh, do that kind of topology. Right. And, and that is a kind of common thing. If you have a single like 
platform ops team that's managing your gateway and all of the routes for it and really wants that tight control over delegating to the application teams rather than letting them manage their own routes. On the other hand, if you can let the application teams <laughs> manage their own routes, that's often a better way to do that because it permits faster development. So, HTTP routes are always associated with some parent or possibly multiple parents, although we're not going to show that one. The parent here is our Ingress gateway controller in the default namespace. We are going to go ahead and match any path with a prefix of slash GUI slash will get routed to the service called Faces GUI on port 80. And we are going to use a filter to rewrite the URL with just slash. And the reason for that is that that's what the application wants, that the GUI application expects that it will be seeing rooted paths and nothing else. So this is how we can expose it to the public internet at a different, at path, a different than, path yeah, than what the application might expect. This is kind of table stakes for any Ingress controller. You have to be able to do path rewrites. You have to be able to do path matching. And we're going to demonstrate that. So when I do that, if I come back to the web browser, it now loads the GUI, and we get grimacing faces on purple backgrounds, because what the GUI is doing for each cell is it is trying to go and fetch a different path, slash face slash, and we have not routed that one yet. So let's go through and put in a route for that. The face route is pretty much the same thing, except that it has a different prefix, and it uses a different backend ref. So we have the GUI prefix is getting routed to the GUI workload, and the face prefix is getting routed to the face workload. Uh, but they're basically the same idea. And if I do this, then things start working. And we have grinning faces on blue backgrounds. And now, if we can jump over to my laptop, I will walk through the same thing with Istio. <laughs> and it will look exactly the same. That is the hope. <laughs> so we're just going to wait a minute to see if uh, we can get our laptop switched over to my screen. There All we go. Right. So as you can see, we're using the same HTTP route. It the looks, same file? It's literally <laughs> the same file. <laughs> it, it's not just it looks similar. It's, it's literally the same file. Um, and yeah, so we will now keep trying to apply it and jump over to our browser, refresh, and there same we go. Thing. There's our uh, first initial one of we've exposed the GUI, but the GUI is trying to go back through the ingress um, and reach that face app, and it's still not able to do that. So similarly, we're going to deploy the same uh, face root app to expose that to the public internet as well. Again, identical, it's the same file. <laughs> we'll cube cuddle apply it. And if we jump back over to the browser, <laughs> whoo. <laughs> It feels a little silly to be showing, hey, we did the same thing, and we got the same result. <laughs> but remember that the infrastructure underneath this is completely different between these two clusters. So that part's kind of cool. We have Linkerd with uh, its Rust-based proxies, with Envoy Gateway, a completely separate product uh, in front, serving as the ingress. Yep. Uh, and then Istio and with Istio. our Envoy sidecars and our uh, integrated uh, mesh or, or ingress that's part of the Istio product. So it's yeah. really kind of cool just how flexible this is that you can use the same API to control these completely different implementations. It's a little depressing that we're still relying on Envoy and both of them. We've got to fix that. Eh, we'll, we'll get around that. <laughs> OK. Um, how about come back to this laptop again, please? You looks like you're live. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
Excuse me. Okay, so what else can we do here? Well, one kind of another table stake sort of thing for most gateway controllers is the whole canary concept, this AB thing. So let's start by showing, depending on how you look at it, you can look at this as a canary test or you can look at this as progressive delivery, where what we're going to do here is we're going to take a certain amount of traffic from the face workload going to the color workload, and we're going to shift it over to color two, so that instead of getting blue backgrounds, the ones that get shifted over to color two should show orange backgrounds. We will do that by applying another HTTP route, just configured differently. There are a couple of substantial differences with this. We should, we should jump back over to the slides for a minute, just so we can show on the mesh diagram kind of like what we're going to be doing here. We can do that. This is why there are two of us up here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Gateway API, we just showed how to do it um, for ingress traffic. That's what both of those routes were doing. Um, they were even, uh, the, the GUI was expecting a public uh, address. So even though they're both inside the same cluster, it was actually going out of the cluster and reaching back through the public IP, through the public uh, address to reach that face service. So both of those were uh, ingress routes. Well, the GUI is the one trying to talk to the face workload. Yes. So that, must be. that request is coming from outside the cluster. So it yes. has to be the gateway controller doing it. Yes. That. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as a little bit of background, um, get the Gamma Initiative uh, was a project that we started in 2022 to kind of figure out if it might be possible to use gateway API for service mesh implementations. This is not the first time we've tried this, having a common API uh, for meshes, because we really, in spite of like how many different service mesh offerings they, there are, they really solve very similar problems. They have different ways of doing them, different pros and cons, different functionality in some cases, but really at the core, uh, they do a lot of the same things. So uh, an earlier iteration of this you may have heard of is the service mesh interface, or SMI spec. Uh, that's where Flynn and I met, actually, through uh, some it, of the work on Yeah, that. actually it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and th that's also uh, where I met Keith Maddox, uh, and some of the discussions started in that project about, hey, this gateway API thing, <laughs> it has a lot of traction. Like, there's a lot of people working with this, and it actually looks really similar to the thing that we're doing with our traffic split. Um, maybe we can use that. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we reached out to uh, John Howard uh, from uh, Google's Istio uh, team and reached out to Flynn, uh, Linger D, and started to think about, like, hey, this seems like a thing that might be a viable solution, and also a whole lot of other implementations are betting on this, too. And that's really kind of what was the critical mass there, is because there were so many uh, vendors invested in it, it felt like there was a high probability of it going somewhere, of it actually being a thing that we can count on to be the future of how you configure your service mesh. Um, yeah, so we, we saw that uh, you can hopefully make things better uh, for users by adopting these common APIs. Uh, and yeah, Linkerd started using Gateway API for mesh traffic routing in 2.13, one of the very relatively recent releases. Uh, it's funny that that's relatively recent, and it's also like, I want to say a year old, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's about right. Um, uh, and then, yeah, Istio started using Gateway API for ingress much earlier on mm -hmm. um, in 1.9, so that's been around quite a while, uh, but only added mesh traffic routing much more recently in 1.19. Another, I guess, a thing that I want to emphasize a little bit is one of the really interesting things about the Gamma Initiative is that it's very easy for people to say, oh, hey, meshes are routing HTTP. We should just go ahead and do that. But it turns out to be complex. So it was a much more challenging thing to do. Um, partly because it ends up being more challenging than we thought it was, there are a bunch of things that you can't actually do yet for service meshes. Some of them are complex things, but some of them are fairly basic things like retries which you would think would be really easy, but it turns out that people handle retries and timeouts and stuff like that 
very, very differently across implementations of the gateway controllers and service meshes. So this is a, there's a lot of work going on very actively in improving this situation. It's also one of the reasons why it's really great having so many different implementations as active it's participants necessary. in Gateway API is yeah. it would not be as successful as it is today without the feedback and perspectives of people who are approaching these same problems differently. And it yep. pushes us to make these more extensible solutions that allow uh, for different ways of doing things. Linkerd and Istio have different ways of handling retries. Um, I think the Envoy proxy recently added support for doing a very similar way uh, to uh, Linkerd's method of doing retries. Yeah. So that's something where we see that as, hey, if we can add this in Gateway API, we know that there's multiple implementations that could support this, because that's really critical for getting something into the upstream API, is making sure that it's useful to more than one, and not just something that should be one of those like implementation-specific options. Um, but yeah, we, we, we see a path forward for this kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, it's yeah. pretty exciting. And uh, timeouts uh, was one of the ones that until very recently was not available. Uh, but there's now a, a gap, a gateway enhancement proposal uh, that merged uh, a few months back. And support is now available in, I think, the latest Istio uh, major release and the, one of the latest Linkerd Edge releases. Yeah, that's from like six months ago. <laughs> Um, timeouts turned out to be ridiculously hard looking at the different implementations. But the core thing here is that we showed, or the, the core thing for Gamma is that we showed bits where you would use the parent ref referring back to your gateway. For the mesh, you're going to use a parent ref that refers to a service. Yeah. And in both cases, you use backend refs to talk about where you want the traffic to go. Um, I am going to skip these slides. The, oh, go back to that one. That's, that's the important one. <laughs> yeah. This is a, a demonstration of what we are doing differently as we're about to do this, this canary deployment here, is that some of the traffic will get routed over by the mesh from face to color two instead of going to color. And then the rest of it will stay with the color workload. OK. There we go. So, yeah, here we have, like we were saying, our parent ref here is a service. We're talking about the color service. You need to specify which port it's on. And then 90% of our traffic will continue on to the color backend. And 10% will go on to color two. Now, this may look like there is a circular route here. Because we're saying, take 90% of the traffic from color and send it to color. But then it would just get re-split you know, re over and over again, over again. This is one of the things that's complex with service meshes. When we talk about a parent ref, we are talking about the part of a service that's allocating a cluster IP and a DNS name. And we're talking, when we talk about a backend ref, we're talking about the part of a service that is a bag of endpoints. And the two are not the same thing. So there is no circle here. This is one of the more confusing things about Gateway API for Mesh, I think. Um, I will leave it as an exercise to the reader to determine how many cells should be orange if 10% of the traffic is getting routed. But you can see that some of it is getting routed. And um, Let me do one more step, and then we'll flip over to yep. Istio. If we change the weights, we would expect the fraction of traffic that's orange to change. So in this case, instead of 90%, instead of a 90-10 split, we're going to do a 50-50 split. And then when I apply that, we should see a lot more orange over there instantly. And yeah, now let's flip over to Istio, and we will see that happening over there. While we wait for the video to switch, I'll point out that there is no requirement that the weights add up to 100 in the HTTP route. The important thing is just the ratio. So you can do a weight of one and a weight of three, and it adds up to 25% and 75%, right. for example. Doing it with percentages just tends to be a little bit easier for me. Well, it's been uh, easier to explain in some ways. Um, yeah, can we switch to the other laptop, please? Thank you. All right. So as we can see, mine are currently still uh, all in the blue, and I'm about to uh, apply the exact same resource, the color canary.yaml. 
Uh, I did make one tiny difference here as we were um, working on this. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> I forgot to pull um, that. I, I need to go back and double check if it's something that Istio and Linkerd like have slightly different support, if it's something that's specific to Linkerd, or if it's something that is standard that I should go add to Istio. But uh, the group that you'll see here, um, because services in the core uh, Kubernetes API group, um, I have an empty string for the group. It's a little bit awkward. Uh, on Linkerd, you'll see, you'll, you will have seen that Flynn had the word core there. Um, empty string works for both. <laughs> So that is typically what you'll be writing. I need to double check if it's actually okay for us to specify core, but that didn't work for me. So um, mine, mine are empty string, but uh, empty string works for both. I just hand edited my version <laughs> to use the empty string to verify that it worked. It works with Linkerd. And yeah, now, now that we have- Which makes me feel much better. <laughs> now that we have that 10%, uh, you can see a few orange smileys coming through. And same thing. Uh, we're going to switch to 50 50 and apply. And you have 50 50 now. Why don't you go ahead and do the next step yeah, as well? Sure. And then the next step that we're going to do is fully switch it all the way uh, over to 100 to our new Orange service. This is a thing that I wanted to show in particular because. Having, I, I just said the important thing was the ratio, and then we just demonstrated one where the weight is zero, so the ratio gets to be a weird concept. Zero is kind of a special case that says, don't take any traffic for this. Uh, on the other hand, like you can't do two backend refs that both have a weight of zero. That will not give you a 50-50 split. I don't know what that does, but I'm sure it does nothing. I forget if a controller would reject it. I don't know. I wonder. We'll, yeah. we'll try it later. Um, <laughs> But it's kind of handy to be able to use a weight of zero for this, because if you're doing progressive deployment, it makes it easy to go all the way over and then decide, OK, well, things are great. Now I can go ahead and clean up and use the new version, which we will let Mike demonstrate. <laughs> all right. So jumping back to here, what I'm going to do first is delete the old deployment. Now that we've successfully uh, done our switchover, um, we want to make sure that we don't have this awkward route in place forever that is redirecting things that are going to the color workload over to color two. Ideally, we can get back to having our single workload just named color. So, From a functional point of view, having color traffic always routed to color two forever will work fine. Yeah. But operationally, <laughs> it will get you into some troubling situations. Because six weeks down the road, people will forget about that. And then somebody will do something with the color workload and go, oh my god, color's not working. I need to restart it. And then they restart it, and nothing happens. So yeah, De definitely idea. best practice to, as you're doing these kind of transitions, like clean up after yourself. Yeah. So what we're doing now is we're going to look at this color replacement YAML, um, which we're going to deploy uh, back to the original one. This is, we're deploying our color two service, but we're deploying it back to the original one. And then what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to get rid of that route. And you'll see that uh, traffic will just drop back to the original one, uh, which is now running the new uh, actual workload. The only difference actually in the YAML is the environment variable named color. So it's not a very profound change for this particular application. So as you see, like I deleted the, the original workload. Everything's still going through to that new one currently. Um, I'll apply the uh, YAML for that color workload for that uh, color deployment again, and roll it back out. It's rolled out, and nothing's going to go to it yet. Um, but this is the change that should be invisible, is we're going to delete that HTTP route. So we're removing that redirect now that we've successfully deployed back to that original name for this service. So we deleted the HTTP route, and we jump over here, and there's no change visible to the users. It's that always nice <laughs> when things work. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, and I'll hand it back over to Flynn to okay. talk about how uh, rollbacks. Can we switch over to here? Rollbacks are kind of a, I don't know, they're a little underwhelming to watch, but it's an important thing to be able to do. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is do a 50-50 split for, over to, to sorry, a 50-50 split for the smiley workload between Smiley and Smiley2. So when I do this, what I should see is half of that will be grinning Smiley's and the other half will be hard-eyed Smiley's. But if you were paying attention early when we installed this thing, you will remember me saying that I deliberately configured Smiley2 to be bad. Um, this is exactly the same resource that we showed earlier for the 50-50 split, just it's Smiley instead of color. So when I apply that, uh, I do see some hard-eyed smileys, but I also see some cursing faces, because that's where the smiley2 workload fails. This is something that you this will happen. be able to, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is the reality of you yeah. deploy a new thing, it has a bug, sure your new feature you think launched, but maybe you need to pull it back yeah. because something's not right. Fortunately, this is not a difficult thing to do. We just delete the HTTP route and pretend it never happened. <laughs> and there you go. That's it. We've, we've just deployed a bad service and then rolled back, and it was horribly difficult. Right? And, and that's just because we're not just deploying directly over the old deployment. We're creating a new deployment, and we're creating this HTTP route to only shift a small percentage of traffic over. So we can test it and hopefully catch those errors early and be able to roll back before this gets out to all of our users. So at this point, the next couple of steps in the demo are prepping for the next thing I'm going to do, uh, uh, which is to say I'm going to make Smiley 2 so it doesn't error all the time. Um, but let's go over to the other laptop to make sure that this works for Istio while I'm doing that. Right. So again, uh, same route. I'm applying, or sorry, uh, yes, same route, uh, applying that. And let's jump into the browser and check out it. Same errors. <laughs> it really is nice when we get identical behavior in different environments. And we're going to do the exact same thing to roll back. We're going to just delete that HTTP route. And with that gone, our errors start dis disappearing. Cool. All right, can we come back to this laptop again, please? Merci. So another thing we can do is, you remember that we were talking about being able to do routing based on HTTP headers, which is sort of the basis of an A-B test. Instead of just picking a random subset of your traffic to divert to the other workload, you pick it based on specific values, like the user's name or whatever. So I'm going to do an A-B test here based on the X faces user header. Specifically, um, I'm doing this with traffic going to Smiley. If the request has a header that says a X faces user test user, then take that to Smiley2. And if you look carefully at this resource, you'll see that this is all one stanza. So this backend ref is a peer of this matches. This backend ref does not have a matches clause at all. So this is kind of the, the default case. If we have the test user header, we go to Smiley2. If we don't, we go to Smiley. And this is something that you can have like your A-B test infrastructure do, where you can like have it uh, inject headers like this uh, into your services. Um, yeah, I think like launch darkly and similar things. Like there's support, there's but, a bunch yeah. of them. Yeah. It's, this is also, this is table stakes. Yes. You need to be able to do this to have a functioning API for solving the English problem. What I have here is one browser that has no user associated with it. And in my other browser, it says user test user because I'm just using mod header to inject X faces user test user into all the requests. So when I do this, we should see that bottom browser window instantly switch over to hard eyed smileys while the upper browser stays that way. Uh, and let's switch over and you can see this Dio can do the same thing as well. 
I don't think I set up my browser to do the, the header inject, but I'm gonna see if I might be able to do it um, manually. So, yep, uh, there we go, deploying the same route. We'll kubectl apply it. And you can see that nothing's going to hard add smileys currently. Um, what is the best way to change that user to test user? Uh, mod header. <laughs> or you could just show it with curl, come to think of it. Hmm. All right. I am going to skip over this for now. That's uh, also a fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to skip over for now rather than try to spend a few minutes uh, getting something working. But sorry for sorry for forgetting to check with that with you. Yeah, ahead of time. it's all right. <laughs> Mike's going great. Thanks for throwing me under the bus, Flynn. <laughs> really appreciate that. But um, as, as you can see, though, um, without that header applied, traffic is still going uh, yeah. directly to uh, the regular service. Okay. How about let's switch back to the other laptop then, and we'll. we'll Continue a bit. All right. So this is another one where we could modify this route. If we decide that our user base just really loves the hard-eyed smileys, and so we want to do everything with hard eyes, then we could do this by inserting another matches clause into the previous route. But it's a lot easier just to delete that backend ref entirely. And this is now a route that will unconditionally take all the traffic that was going to the Smiley service and send it to the Smiley 2 service. So when I apply this one, everybody gets hard eyes. Now, we mentioned earlier, this is not a state that you should leave your cluster in, especially because right now we have a Smiley workload that's getting no traffic whatsoever, and that will be very confusing operationally. I'm just going to delete the A-B test route, which will switch everybody back to normal grinning smileys, but you know, cleans up for this next little chunk of the demo. Um, Let's flip back over to me so I can just show the same thing. Of yeah. We're going to be uh, deleting that other backend ref um, to remove that filter and making sure that everything is going over uh, to Smiley 2 instead. So that everything is still going to Smiley. Actually, you could just do that one. Yeah, and it's, we'll it's fine. You, you won't yeah. notice. You, you won't notice we'll anything. anything. So <laughs> we, well, let's we go ahead and talk here. quickly about timeouts. Um, timeouts are a little bit interesting because if you look over the browsers, you'll see some of these where the cell kind of fades away, and that's because a call took too long. So we can use timeouts to make this a better experience for the user. Demoing timeouts is a little bit weird because timeouts are really about returning agency to the client. They actually tend to increase load on your workloads, which can be interesting. And visually, it can be a little bit weird to make sure that we demo what's going on properly. So what we're going to do is we're going to start down in the call graph. We're going to add a timeout to the color service first. And what you'll see in the GUI is if the timeout fires, you'll see pink backgrounds instead of orange or blue. So if I do, oh, yeah. And this is a very important point. I'm ashamed to admit it, but Linkerd is not all the way up to Gateway API 1.0 yet. So this is the only place in this demo where we have to do things differently between Istio and Linkerd. To do this with Linkerd, I have to use a different API group. We're getting this fixed. <laughs> so in the Linkerd version, you'll see that I'm now using this policy.linkerd.io resource. Uh, it's a long story, but this is the way Linkerd started experimenting with Gateway API before it was possible for a mesh to be conformant with Gateway API. So this was the way we kind of had to do that. 
Um, the same thing with the parent ref. Here, we're adding a timeouts clause to the backend ref. We're saying, overall, if the request as a whole takes more than 300 milliseconds, cut it short, return timeout. And when I do this, we should start seeing some pink cells showing up. It's a little trickier to see that with the orange things than I would have thought, but that's OK. Um, we can do the same thing with smileys. Again, 300 millisecond timeout and smileys, we will get a sleeping face whenever that times out. So you can already see that first, there are fewer fading cells now because we've, what happens is the face workload has to talk to the smiley workload and the color workload. So it will always take longer than either of them. But now that we're cutting those short, deeper in the call graph, the front service actually behaves differently now. So we see fewer fading out cells, but we still see some. Um, let's flip over to this laptop. Uh-oh, Mike is editing something. That makes me nervous. I'm just making sure the API group uh, or version is uh, correct for the Istio one. <laughs> That's a good thing to check, yeah. <laughs> I was the one who added the timeout part to the demo, and so it's uh, entirely possible that I could have copied the file and then forgot to change the API group for Istio. So yeah, if we can just switch over to my laptop again, I'll be able to just show the one difference in this file that hopefully on a future release of Linkerd, we'll get yeah. back over to uh, the official Gateway API. This is not a permanent thing for Linkerd, definitely. Could we get the other laptop, please? Ah, thank you. All right. So if you can see just the top line of this file here, uh, instead of the special Linkerd API version group, uh, we have the official gateway.networking.cates.io slash v1. Um, and then I'm going to try to deploy this smiley. Uh, oh, that's the smiley timeout, but that's the same as the other one. That was the one I just had to edit. <laughs> uh, the color timeout's the same. Uh, or gateway.networking.cates.io. Um, and I'll jump over to deploy this. So color timeout Istio. Um, looks like that. And we should start seeing some pink cells appearing. Yep. And there we go. So now we'll deploy the next one to add some artificial latency and timeout uh, handling on the smiley timeout, which again, using, using that uh, API group, is the only reason that we have different files. This will eventually reconcile in the very near future. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not that eventually. <laughs> uh, and now you start seeing those uh, smileys with the Snoozy <laughs> icon because they're taking a nap. Uh, that, that service um, is being basically cut off um, by the face service because uh, it says, yep, sorry, you took too long. Uh, just return, just I'm going to error out instead and ship what I have off to the end user rather than making them wait potentially for 10 seconds or something like that. Yep. So why don't you go ahead with your laptop here? Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is to do that timeout also for the face workload itself. But this one we're going to do with the gateway controller, not with a service mesh. So if you look at the, I think it's going to show you the next resource. Oh, right. There's some explanation in there because the GUI gets to make kind of interesting choices about what it wants to do for a timeout. What the GUI currently does is it will keep, the, if the face service itself times out, then the GUI will just show the old data. But for the moment, we increment a counter in the corner so you can see how often it happens. If it keeps happening over and over again, we'll fade the whole cell out as a timed out cell. So hopefully we'll see some of that. So let's take a look at this resource here. Um, you'll notice the parent ref is now back to ingress because we're applying this for the gateway controller to 
to take action because yep. it's the gateway controller is the one that's mediating the connection into the, the face workload. You could do this with a mesh as well, but the ingress controller is a, often a more graceful way. And, and we're back on the common API version as well because right. we're uh, configuring because Envoy Gateway or Istio's ingress. Right. And we're actually editing the existing face route because we're just, we already have a route that does this. We just want to modify it slightly. So we're just adding a timeout clause to it. Uh, you'll also note that the timeout here is deliberately less than the 300 millisecond timeout from either of the backend workloads, mostly because it makes it easier to see something different. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to apply this, and then hopefully we should start seeing a counter appear. All right, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so you can see that easier. But you'll also notice that the we see a lot fewer of the pink backgrounds or sleeping faces because now the GUI is protecting us from that yep. with the shorter timeout all the way at the front. If we let this go long, yeah, there we go. We got a, we got a cell that faded out a little bit or that, that turned less opaque. There's got to be a better word than fade for that. <laughs> so yeah, so this is how you can have a more robust kind of timeout ar architecture like within your mesh so that you don't end up with like extraneous long-lived things that are putting an inordinate load on your services inside. So you're able to uh, kind of manage the health of those services inside your mesh more predictably, yep. um, but still have that uh, control at the external layer to really protect the user from seeing all of the things that you're doing inside your microservice architecture. So let's come back to uh, the other laptop, please. This, that's the end of the workshop stuff. Let's talk a little bit about gotchas. Um, very important, when things are not working, the first thing to look at is going to be the status on your various gateway API resources, especially HTTP routes. Um, one of the most common failures that you run across is you create an HTTP route, but the parent ref is wrong, or the permissions are wrong. So no gateway controller or no implementation of the gateway API actually claims it and does anything with it. And you will see that in the status. And, and this is actually, really, you'll see that there's nothing in the status, and yeah, that will tell and, you that nothing claimed it. And, and this is exactly the problem that I ran into uh, when I had that wrong API group where right. it said core. I did exactly this step. I did kubectl get HTTP root, the, the name of it in the faces namespace, uh, and check the status. And there was nothing there because the Istio gateway API controller didn't understand what group core was. So uh, once I switched it to the empty string, then I was able to check the status of that route and see, oh, it was recognized, it was populated, the controller will list something that says like accepted true, it'll say conflicted false, uh, and a handful of other things to kind of like let you know that that route was recognized, it was applied, it was understood, and then it was yeah. actually programmed into the underlying architecture. I've had the opposite experience with Linkerd. If you don't specify group, the group empty string or group core for us, if you don't specify that, it usually assumes that the group is gateway.networking.cates.io, which if you're trying to use a service is wrong. Yeah. yeah. So, same thing. <laughs> what is going on? Check the statuses. Oh, OK, now I get it. Um, and, and, and there's also a links on there for like, the, yeah. In the API specification reference on the Gateway API website, uh, you can look for gateway condition type, gateway condition reason, route condition type, route condition reason, and you'll find a detailed explanation of what each of the possible standard ones are. Uh, each implementation can also add some of their own if they have unique things that they're able to express. Right. As a human, usually you can just read it and it makes sense, which is kind of nice. You remember I mentioned earlier that there's a distinction between the parent ref and the backend ref for how the service, how a service will be interpreted. This is kind of important. You can't do things like this in Gateway API. You cannot have requests that go to foo might go to foo or bar, but then requests that go to bar will get split between bar and baz. What ends up happening is that if you have traffic that goes directly to bar, it will be split between bar and baz. 
but traffic that goes to foo will never be split once it reaches bar. And the reason for that is that the parent ref is only interpreted as the, what we call the front end of the service, the thing with the DNS name and a cluster IP. So if you address traffic directly to one of the endpoint IPs, we're not going to split it or do anything funky like that. Um, the end result is that if you try to set up an architecture like this, you are actually setting up something that looks like this. And this is not a bug so much as it is a thing to be aware of. I don't see this changing anytime soon because if it does change, oh my God, things yeah. get complicated. It, it really actually isn't designed to protect you from really nasty cyclical things where you start losing a complete understanding yeah. of where your traffic is <laughs> getting shipped off to. Yeah, it, it's, it's fun to go down the rabbit hole, but it's, it's a bad idea, right? Yes. Um, uh, oh, can we just jump back over to my laptop for a second? I just want to show an example of kind of like what that status is going to look like that we were talking about. Yeah. Um, you know what? Actually, let me talk about this slide really quickly because we're at the end and we yeah, should yeah. be opening up for questions anyway. Um, yeah, so we talked about using Gateway ABI for north, south, and east, west routing in the same cluster at the same time. We mentioned earlier, yeah, you should definitely consider Gateway API for new stuff. Uh, you should learn if you're not wanting to use it for new stuff right now. There are pretty easy ways to use tools like Argo and Flagger to automate, you know, to use Gateway API for progressive delivery with all of their funky stuff. Uh, Linkerd works well with those. Istio works well with those. I don't think I've actually personally tried it with Envoy Gateway, but hey, it's a Gateway API. It'll work. That's sure. Um, and you can check on the SigNetwork calendar for the Gateway API and Gamma meetings, both of which tend to alternate time zones to try to make it convenient wherever you are in the world. And with that, yes, let's go back to this laptop so that we can take a look at some status. Yeah, so just, this is just an example. Uh, I did kubectl get HTTP root, namespace faces, and the face root's the one that I'm looking at as an example. I'm um, piping it to YQ. We talked about that in the beginning. Uh, it's just like JQ, but for YAML to be able to colorize it and uh, filter. So I'm only showing the status field. Uh, and you'll see uh, the parents group here is the parent ref at the bottom there uh, is saying that this HTTP route uh, is attached or is, is targeting uh, the Istio uh, ingress gateway. Um, well, it's targeting, sorry, a gateway by the name ingress, which happens to be an implementation of Istio in this case. Uh, if Flynn did the same thing, this would actually look the same. It would have the same <laughs> name, but it would be a very different gateway controller. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the controller name, though, you'll see is the Istio gateway controller. So that's how you can tell that this is being recognized and parsed and reported uh, by my controller uh, for Istio and not the Linkerd controller. Um, and then the list of conditions there, you'll see when it was updated, you'll uh, see the type of the condition, and then the status, and then the reason for the two basic ones, uh, accepted true means the controller says that it's syntactically valid and is trying to understand it. Um, and then resolve ref means that for the services that you defined in the backend refs, that they are real things that it understands. <laughs> <laughs> so if you make a typo there, you might see something like resolve refs false, and that's a great place to check if traffic is not going uh, to where you expect it to go. And that's basically it. So if there are any questions, now is a great time. If there are no questions, I'll be very surprised. Yeah, go ahead. So, so that's, are there plans to integrate egress functionality into Gateway API, and if so, when? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, that, that's a really interesting question. It's definitely something that has come up. There are a, a few vendors that are interested in working on egress functionality. Um, there was an attempt at writing a GEP <laughs> to propose some of this. 
I think that we ended up holding on it for now because we couldn't find enough common ground between different implementations to really understand what no. the best way to do this was going to be. One of the real challenges with Gateway API is as you start looking at different functionality, you realize that the different implementations can do very, very different things at a detailed level. And uh, yeah, life can be really complex with that. And egress in particular has maybe even egress more different use cases. So like when I'm looking at egress from the perspective of a mesh like SDO, I want like an allow list of specific domains or something like that that my traffic is allowed to exit to. Um, when you have, say, a telco provider or somebody building gateways <laughs> for them working with egress, what they're thinking of is I want to make sure my traffic exits on a stable IP from the tower. So that is an extremely different concern, even though they're both in the realm of egress gateway. So, it, it, yeah. It, one of the really entertaining things that happened was when some of the folks dealing with 5G telephony started coming to gateway API meetings and all of us who are not in 5G telephony went, oh my God, you guys are, wait, wait what? Explain <laughs> that again? <laughs> it, it's really exciting. There's a lot of potential, maybe long term, but yeah. it's definitely not something that's on the immediate roadmap. Um, there's yeah. also other efforts to deal with egress traffic underway in network policy that we want to make sure that we're not doing to do something terribly different from. Uh, so yeah, making sure that we're trying to have those conversations and reconcile our approaches across the Kubernetes landscape with other SIGs is going to be an important part of how we approach egress as well. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the workshop. It was very fun. Thank to you. Uh, I got a question about how the priorities of matchers are working because in essence HTTP routes are decentralized. You can have multiple different objects matching on slightly different things and it is reasonable to assume that there is the same matcher in different HTTP routes. Which one will actually take precedence? Uh, the short answer to that question is you need to look at the Gateway API documentation and there's a whole section on exactly that question. Um, very broadly speaking, more specific things win over less specific things. But there's, there's stuff to read there. <laughs> <laughs> there are, at least for a good chunk of that, there are conformance tests so that yeah. Most implementations should behave the same way. Um, that's where you'll also potentially see things like if your routes are targeting completely different HTTP paths and they're able to like be applied simultaneously without conflicting with each other, then that might be fine and that might work. Um, if they're trying to do two different things like attach a gRPC route and HTTP route to the same listener, you might get an error like a conflicted uh, raised and the implementation will say that, sorry, you can't do that. Yep. Uh, I got another quick question. Um, what happens in a situation where the backend ref is not healthy from the point of view of Kubernetes? So the service itself doesn't have any endpoints backing it. If the service exists, but it has no workloads, I think traffic to the route gets 500s. But I would have to go look that one up exactly. And if there are several uh, services backing it, would uh, automagic uh, load balancing happen to the failover? That's actually going to tell you, um, that's going to depend on the implementation and how it does that one. We are being told that we are out of time. I am apolog apologize for the folks whose questions we didn't get to. We will both be up here, so absolutely come on up and ask your questions anyway. And you can find us in these places or the CNCF Slack or via email. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.